So today I'll be telling you about Peanuts, uh, which is a web, web scale data serving system that we built at Yahoo. Um, so before I get started, let me just, just quickly tell you about myself and a little bit about the project. Uh, so I work in the research lab in the systems group at Yahoo, and uh, we do a variety of projects. I mainly focus on projects that sort of are at the boundary of distributed systems and data management. So I've worked in the Peanuts system a lot. Uh, as well as some projects in Hadoop, some work that actually crosses the boundary between those two that I'll touch on today, uh, and, a, and a few other topics. Um, so Peanuts itself has been around for over four years, and it's actually a project that started as a collaboration between an engineering group um, at Yahoo uh, in, the, in our cloud group, and, and then our research group in research. And so we've been building this kind of a unique, um, unique project. We've been building it in collaboration with them and have very close ties to them. Um, and I've been doing that for, for a number of years. And so the project is known externally as Peanuts, but you also, especially if you are familiar with any of the internal names for Yahoo projects, might have heard about it as Sherpa. And uh, I don't think I have Sherpa written down on any of these slides, but if I do, that's Peanuts. And so, yeah, Peanuts is, if it is an acronym, I don't know it. I don't think it's an acronym. Uh, it's just all capitals, so don't let it fool you. Okay, so here's an outline of what I'll be talking about. Um, so the first thing I want to do is give you an overview of Peanuts architecture. Um, and once I do that, we really have built a lot of interesting features and solved a lot of interesting challenges here, especially because the system's uh, you know, live into it and supporting a lot of Yahoo applications. But we've also written a lot of uh, papers talking about these features. So what I'm going to concentrate on today are either things we've done recently and haven't talked so much about, or at least explore things that have sort of cropped up in production as, as our uh, adoption has taken off. Um, so I'll cover some of those things, and I'll just at the end talk a little bit about how how it's going and who's using peanuts and how we've grown recently. Okay, so at a, at Yahoo, we are running a, a fairly big cloud infrastructure. I mean, obviously it's a private cloud, but uh, a lot of you know, but it's a private cloud used by a lot of different uh, applications at Yahoo. And so we like to divide uh, this space into sort of three categories. So one category that everyone's probably familiar with is the large large data analysis category. So we are we at Yahoo were um, some of the earliest uh, uh, builders of the Hadoop system, earliest committers, and so we use Hadoop for a lot of our large scale um, data analysis. Probably probably all of it at this point. Um, that's not the work I'll be talking about today. The work I'll be talking about today is more um, focused on low latency single record access uh, so CRUD sort of workloads. And so that's where Peanuts is one of the major systems, and that's what I'm covering here. And then there's a third category, which I won't be talking about either, which sort of has to do with in-between data sizes, when you're storing things like videos or, uh, or pictures. Um, where do you store those? We have a system at Yahoo called Mob Store uh, for that. So let's start uh, talking about what Peanuts is. So um, we can think of Peanuts as being a parallel database, uh, meaning that you've got a large, large sets of data uh, distribute over many servers, so that's what you see here. And one of the uh, most well-known techniques for just dividing data um, among a bunch of servers is to do it with horizontal partitioning, so that's what we've done here. Uh, we divide our, our data into horizontal uh, chunks, which we call tablets, and just distribute them over servers. Um, one of the other core things about Peanuts that's been here since the, since the very beginning is a geographic replication. So not only is your data um, available in one data center and partitioned like you see on the left, but it's also available in a, in, a, in a number of data centers across the world, and I'll talk more about that as we go. Uh, so Peanuts also provides uh, flexible schemas. You don't need to define your schemas in advance. So this uh, script which you see here, which would be used for creating a table in MySQL, um, we don't have that in Peanuts. Instead, you can describe your, you can, you can create schemas on a per record basis. We actually do it with JSON. And uh, finally, Peanuts is a hosted system. So although it's um, internal to Yahoo, within Yahoo, our customers don't install Peanuts and run it on their own hardware. It's just a big multi-tenant uh, multi hosted environment. So in a lot of ways, analogous to uh, simple DB on Amazon. OK, so here's a very dense uh, slide with some just high-level design points about Peanuts. So let me, uh, let me just cover some of these areas to get, give you a feel for what, what things we care about. So, so a, big, a big deal for us is making the simple, making a large system very simple. So we want the system to run on commodity servers. We want to be able to add 
um, extra capacity just by adding more servers. And we want to keep the APIs relatively simple. So in fact, we just support um, lookup by key and also range scans. I'll talk a little bit about what we do with indexing a little bit later. So this isn't entire, entirely it. Um, so anyone who's familiar with these sorts of systems and systems like HBase has probably seen the, this, this type of list before. Um, the second thing that, it, that is very dear to us is, is global access. Um, many of the applications at Yahoo that are using peanuts do have a global presence. So what they're looking for is good performance no matter where in the world they are running. So let's just dig into that a little bit. Um, they want low latency for all of their accesses, whether those be reads or writes. So the reason we, uh, we one of the reasons that we replicate geographically is so we can provide uh, low latency reads to all of our customers, no matter where they are. And uh, the reason, and then of course, we don't want to uh, make the writes slow because of that. So we actually use async. We actually have asynchronous replication across these data centers. And I'll explain how shortly. But the key is that any time a customer does a write, we can return success to them immediately, and then we take care of replication. We don't make them wait while we replicate. And uh, anytime you're doing anything with asynchronous replication, you have some tricky consistency issues. So we have uh, two sort two types of consistency, and I'll be talking about those. Uh, and then finally, we want this type of system to be extremely simple to operate. When you build a big system like this, and it's not simple to operate, you have to hire an army of people to run it. And so what we're looking for in terms of operability is that um, the system can recover automatically from failures, both in the sense that if something goes down, you can still find your data elsewhere, and also that the system automatically recovers. Um, systems like this can often have hot spots, and so we want the system to load balance itself. And uh, finally, we want to run many customers on top of, on top of the one peanuts instance, and so we have to deal with uh, multi-tenant issues. Okay, so now let's dig into the architecture a little more. Uh, so we support two types of tables in peanuts, uh, what we call hash tables and what we call order tables. So here's an example of a hash table. And uh, this is just a, a table of uh, records keyed on types of, I think it's all fruits, I'm not sure about avocado. So let's say fruits and vegetables. And, uh, and then in, on the right you just see their payload. So what I have here highlighted in light blue is uh, one tablet from your table Know, one of our horizontal partitions. And just the key thing to pay attention, like in any hash table, is that we're not physically ordering the records on their primary keys, but on the hash of their primary keys. And so that's uh, slightly different than an order table, which looks very similar in terms of creating tablets and distributing them on servers. The key difference here is that uh, the records are actually physically ordered on their primary keys. So this makes things like uh, range scans possible. Um, you know, scanning for all records that start with a particular letter or a particular prefix um, and makes those things efficient. Uh, here's a picture of one, um, one region's worth of peanuts, so the deployment that you might find in one data center. And uh, let's see, let me start at the bottom. So at the bottom we have what we call storage units. These are the, uh, these are the servers that actually hold your data. And, uh, and so what you see on the bottom is that we're each of these storage units hosts a number of tablets. And in fact, Right now in our current deployment where we store those tablets is in MySQL, so each tablet becomes um, a MySQL table, but we make it very easy to swap out different uh, storage layers and, we, and we've done so. Um, on the right is a what we call a tablet controller. The tablet controller owns the mapping um, between tablets and what uh, storage unit hosts that tablet. And that component is not in the customer data path. Instead, we replicate that tablet map to the routers, which you see in the middle. So the route, each router has a copy of that tablet map. When a request comes in for a key or a range of keys, we can take that key and map it to a tablet, uh, and then map that tablet to a storage unit, and that's where we send the request, and that's the storage unit that, that services the request. Uh, what you really don't see in this picture is any sort of client. Of course, there are clients, but they communicate with peanuts through a REST API. So they have very little dependence on us, and we have very little dependence on them. They just need to know the name of a router to hit, or if there's a VIP standing, sitting in front of the router's um, the VIP address. Um, and that's very nice. If clients have you know, problems, it has nothing to do with our code. It might have something to do with the peanuts being up. You know, if, they're, if they've misconfigured their, their client and are hitting the wrong you know, router name, that's a possibility. But we don't have any of these issues that we've seen that, that have come up where they're running some version of our client or something, and it's incompatible. 
Um, here's a picture of what's going on in one storage unit. So we can think of this, this big disk as being an instance of MySQL, if you like. And each, each of these, um, and this instance of MySQL has a number of these tablets. And over time, uh, different things can happen to these tablets. So tablets can grow uh, because we simply add more records. And if tablets uh, grow too large, we like to keep them at about one gig for uh, recovery purposes. Then we can split the tablet into uh, two pieces. It's also possible we'll get a hotspot if these, some of these tablets are just being hit a lot by the, the client, then the tablet might become overloaded. I'm sorry, and the storage unit might become overloaded. So we'll consider a storage unit overloaded if it starts seeing, if it starts returning things with longer latency and we start to miss our SLA. And if that happens, then we can just offload some tablets from this uh, storage unit to others to try to return it to um, more of an average uh, temperature, an average, average latency. Uh, here's a picture of multiple peanuts regions. So what you see on the left is just a, uh, exactly what I showed you before for a single peanuts region. What you see on the right are just two more uh, regions. So each of these correspond to a data center. So the actual hardware that's deployed in each region is identical. I mean the actual components that is. And uh, exactly, exactly what I showed you before. The key thing we're adding here is a message bus. So the message, I doubt you can read this, but the message bus is a system that we have at Yahoo called Tribble. And it's a pub sub system, and that's how we do our asynchronous replication. So um, in, the, in this Tribble system, uh, we actually have a topic for each tablet in peanuts. And any time uh, a region accepts a write to a particular record or an insert of a record, we propagate that write along the uh, matching topic to each of the other regions. And then in the other regions, there's a subscriber um, to that topic, and the subscriber will receive the message and apply it locally. So although this is how we can um, return to, to a success to a client very quickly, because all we've done is write their message um, to this triple system, we write it in a couple places on disk to make sure it's persistent, we can then we return success in the background, the, act, the updates actually propagate. Um, so here's a picture of how asynchronous replication works in practice. Um, so we have one user somewhere in the northwest, and that user is going to make some write, write attempts, and those perhaps are mapped to uh, our California data center. And um, the pub subsystem simply propagates those writes to the other data center. And uh, the benefit is that if we have some user in the northeast trying to do reads, maybe these two, these two are friends and they're both, and, and the east coast user is accessing the west coast user's profile, uh, we can do that quickly with the east coast um, data center. But the other reason we do asynchronous replication is for uh, business continuity processes. So this PowerPoint I borrowed from someone else, this particular effect is, is beyond me, but uh, if we were to lose our West Coast data center, and also most of our employees, um, we could at least still serve data out of, out of the East Coast. So these are sort of two things we get um, with geographic replication. Okay, so when we start doing asynchronous replications, we have to ultimately make a decision on the uh, availability consistency spectrum, so cap, cap theorem issues. And we actually provide all of these options within peanuts. Uh, if you've ever taken a look at our early paper or you know, somehow saw our early uh, deployed code, you would see that we provided the bottom two options and we added the top one later. So let's, let's go bottom up. Um, when we first released peanuts, we had uh, what we call primary key constraints and a record, record timelines. So we, what we did is we assigned um, each tablet a master and each record once inserted a master region. So anytime you wanted to insert a record, no matter where you were inserting it from, you had to be forwarded to that tablet's master region. And anytime you wanted to update a record, uh, no matter where the update was coming from, you had to be forwarded to the record's master region. Hopefully, if you created the record, it was mastered locally. Um, and what that means is that if there's competing inserts, or then there's competing updates on a record, they all get forwarded to the same region, and that region will serialize the order of the writes. And our pub sub layer, when we publish it to them, the pub sub layer guarantees that these writes will be propagated to the other regions in the same order. So whatever timeline gets established by the master region is played out identically. Um, in the other regions. So we can say that the other regions will be maybe, because of asynchronous replication, they're behind the master, but they are going through the same exact timeline. Uh, we later added another approach um, that you might find in, in systems like Cassandra uh, and Dynamo called eventual consistency, where we um, are willing to sacrifice some consistency to make the data more available and available faster. So, so the problem with uh, 
with the higher consistency models is that one, we have to do sometimes do forwarding, which can add latency. And two, if we have a failure, we sometimes make data unavailable for writes. So with uh, eventual consistency, we make the data available for writes, but now we allow on um, races, and so we have to resolve those. Um, so here's just a, a slightly deeper example. Here's, here's what you get when you, when you choose uh, record timeline consistency. So let's say we have some user, Alice, who's about to do two um, updates to her profile record. One is her status, and one is her location. And so at the beginning of this uh, timeline, Alice is at home and sleeping. So the first thing Alice does is wake up, and she wants to update her status from sleeping to awake. And uh, that's what we see happening in region one. So then suppose Alice goes to work and wants to switch from home to work. And for whatever reason, she's uh, routed to region two. Um, with timeline consistency, that, that request actually gets forwarded back to region one. And we switch uh, from home to work. And the whole point of this is we're preventing, and then, and then that, those rights are propagated to region two. Um, the whole thing we're trying to prevent here is, is uh, competing rights that would result in a state that never really existed. In Alice's mind, she woke up and then she went to work. She never was at work and sleeping, but with eventual consistency, that's the sort of state that can exist temporarily, and maybe she doesn't want people to think she's sleeping at work. So you might choose record timeline consistency for that sort of application. Um, I think I, most, I mostly covered this, so let me just explain a little bit about why we eventually added eventual consistency. Um, we have customers that can handle it, so certain customers have applications uh, that where they can externally guarantee that there are no races for whatever reason, and then there's really no reason for us to enforce uh, timeline consistency. And then there's also customers that can explicitly understand what they're giving up and can cope with that in their application. Uh, I, I like this approach. I think if we had released it, eventual consistency first sets a very high bar and makes things harder on application developers. Now we, we sort of make them think about timeline consistency first, and then only if it makes sense to them um, might they move up to eventual. Yeah. Do you do, uh, so when the master region is down, uh, do you have some kind of manual switchover? There is a manual switchover that can happen if, it's a ten, if it looks like it's something that's not going to come back up right away. And so, Let's say it was down for an hour. We wouldn't prevent writes for an hour, but there would be a short outage where, where writes didn't happen. And there's some you know ugly cases about writes trapped in the region that we are overriding. Those details are too detailed for this talk. Oh, okay. Yeah. So in, in the case of timeline consistency, um, in the example that you gave, for example, will the write immediately return to the user? Because it's, a, it's not a low latency rate anymore, because it gets redirected to the second reason, right? Um, Right. In that case, you know, it's not clear why Alice would be sent to Region 2 if she lives near Region 1, but perhaps some um, trouble in the network. And yeah, that, that write will be slightly slower because it's now, it's now been redirected. Um, it actually, I think under the covers we define that Alice is sort of immediately re redirected to Region 2, and then Region 2 will respond to her, but it will add some lag. Uh, the key point, though, you know, the bigger win is that when we're doing that write, it's not... Uh, we don't have to wait for that write to end up everywhere, including like regions in Asia, before we can write return success to Alice. Okay, yeah. So, so going back to the thing we just went through about trapped writes, say that uh, you know the work one went to region two, and it was about to be routed back to region one. Region one went down for a long time. You decided to to promote like a region three to take region one's writes. Could you take the trapped writes in region two and kind of say now instead of waiting for region one to come back, you should um, or, or does that just get lost? I think we intend in those situations to just, to just lose it because it's a, it's a rare thing. So these, these things can happen. Was there, was there one other question? Yeah, sure. Um, ownership of records, do they get transferred? There's multiple rights happening. Yeah, yeah, good question. So the record mastership is assigned to whatever region. Uh, the, the record is first inserted from. Uh, so if, if, if Alice ten, uh, creates a user profile and that request hits region one initially, then region one will be the master. But if later on Alice moves to you know, another part of the world and her rights come from that part, we'll eventually switch over the mastership. So, so record mastership tends to be, if, if it's the type of record that gets updated by like one, one user, uh, will tend to be mastered in, in the place where it will be low latency. But still, for some application patterns, that's not the case, and 
there will always be some forwarded writes, and so that's where you might also prefer eventual consistency. Okay, uh, so that's that's sort of a, a high level view of the architecture. If you want more details, I'll, I'll give a um, pointer to a paper at the end. Uh, so let's talk about some things that um, I think we, we saw coming when we started doing peanuts, but only now we actually see it in practice. Um, and so these are sort of things that happen when you're running a, a running at this system in production at that scale. So a lot of one of the reasons why systems tend to choose hash tables is a lot of the load balancing problems just go away. Hash, hashing makes a lot of the problems disappear. Uh, order tables makes things more complicated, and I wanted to give you a taste of, of how so. Um, so when you first create an ordered table and you have these tablets, I mean, we can do load balancing. I talked about splitting. I'll get more into that. But you still have to choose some initial set of tablet boundaries. So let's suppose I've got a table with three tablets and I choose initial boundaries of I and S. Um, that may or may not be a good choice. So let's suppose I have a bunch of keys to insert shortly. And for whatever reason, they're all biased towards the beginning of the alphabet. Uh, what happens is most of my load goes to one tablet and the other two are pretty lightly loaded. Uh, this has happened from time to time where a customer has chosen poor tablet boundaries, then they've done a load, then they've noticed that their throughput is much lower than we promised them because it essentially just corresponds to the throughput of one storage unit um, instead of however many, you know, whatever throughput we actually promised them, and, and then they complain. So the answer here is uh, rather than just trying to pick random uh, tablet boundaries, we actually like to get a feel for the customer's data. So let's suppose we were able to take a look at the keys in advance and choose tablet boundaries. We might come up with something like B and L, and then things are uh, evenly divided among the tablets. And so actually, what, so what we do in practice is when customers know they're going to initially load their data, we actually ask them for a sample of their keys. Or uh, Yeah, we ask them for a sample of the keys. And what you can simply do is sort those keys and choose even boundaries based upon the sample. And if, as long as you have enough samples, uh, that will actually give you a good, a good partitioning for the, for the data. This is not a new result. This is something that people were doing in the late 80s, early 90s in, in parallel databases. And uh, this, doesn't, this doesn't just go for um, initially loading a table. If you are just about to load a lot more data into a table you already own, you still might go through this process of realizing that your tablet boundaries are not good considering the upcoming load. And you might uh, do some splits uh, of your tablets to get ready for the load before it actually comes. Okay, so uh, ordered table, the challenges don't stop at just big loads of data. Um, in general, we also see skewed workloads. So you might just have a hot spots that come up from time to time, like maybe data is time ordered and the most recently inserted data is the most popular. These things are possible. And in peanuts, we have sort of uh, two mechanisms to deal with these problems. Uh, tablet split and tablet move. So tablet split just takes the tablet and uh, breaks it in half, or, and uh, a tablet move will take a tablet and move it, move it to another server. So initially, we let we let this. Uh, I guess we're being we're being conservative initially and let an operator decide when to do these things. So if an operator observed a hotspot, they could initiate these two operations. Um, but that whole time, we we're also developing a load balancer, which we call Yak. And so Yak um, does exact Yak now executes these two moves. So it does what you exactly think. Collect stats from the different storage units. The main stat it cares about is the latency these storage units are returning with, because that's ultimately what we're what we're worried about. Um, if, if you're starting to return data with uh, high latency, that tends to mean that the storage unit's taking too many requests and is getting overloaded. So Yak can then issue move and split requests. And even though we're running this automatically with Yak, we remain very conservative. Even when we first released Yak. Um, we, we released it in a recommendation mode where it just made suggestions to the operator, and I guess the operator could uh, press Y or N. This actually reminds me of a particular Simpsons episode, some of you guys might remember, um, although it's not quite that simple. Uh, so even as Yak is running automatically, we remain conservative. And really, there's two reasons. Moves are expensive, moving a big block of data while we're also trying to serve uh, traffic. And so we really want to make sure a hotspot is not just some temporary blip that's going to go away before we can actually finish any move. And uh, the other thing is that splits aren't reversible, so we don't like to split uh, tablets without really needing to. Um, and that's just because we have not implemented uh, merge. Uh, OK. Another feature that we've, we've added in the last couple of years is notifications. We have a lot of customers that want to see a stream of updates to their table, 
and the reason they want those streams, uh, there's a few reasons. They're, they're usually trying to update some external system. So it could be some sort of cache, it could be uh, a type of, it could be an index, like a Lucene style index, or they might just want to uh, dump their writes into Hadoop so that they can look at them later. And so supporting this feature was actually relatively easy for us because of our underlying pub sublayer. So we already have um, a, a component in peanuts that is taking a stream of updates and dropping them off at uh, other peanuts regions and then writing those records there. So it's relatively easy for us to take the same system and expose it to users. Most of the work is just hiding some of the peanuts details from the user and just showing them um, the updates. So the picture on the bottom gives you an idea of how this works. Uh, so the client is continues to write to peanuts like always, and then peanuts using this underlying um, pub sublayer will actually drop the writes off at what we call a notification client. So this is actually a box that the client owns and registered with us. They said something like, I want notifications on my table, and here are the ad here are the ad the host names of some servers that I want to receive the updates. And once they get them, uh, they can consume them. We don't delete them until they consume them. And you know, shortly before they consume them, they should do whatever it is that they want to do with those notifications. And in that way, they can make sure they don't lose any. Um, Another, another feature we've been working on uh, is materialized views. So we prototyped this um, in our group a couple of years ago, and we're sort of on the verge of having this in production. Um, we prototyped a few types of views. The only one we're gonna put in production right now is, is indexes, and this is probably the most valuable thing. So let me give an example of why uh, customers want indexes on peanuts. So let's say we have a, a table of items for sale, um, and these are items are just keyed on unique ID. And we have two fields, type and price. So look, let's suppose you want to see all the bikes for sale. There's no efficient way to do this with this table. You just have to scan the entire thing and search for um, items with type bike. And there's no way that will happen with low latency. And it's also terrible from a system point of view to, to do that kind of operation every time you have a query. Uh, so what you want is an index on the type field. So that would look like this um, if we put it in a peanuts table. It's just, uh, we just take our uh, we create a we create a PNS table where we're keyed on the concatenation of type, and because we need to maintain unique keys, um, the actual uh, primary key. So we have bike item one two three and so forth, and we're bringing along um, value for the ride as in what we call a materialized field. So now, if we want to, uh, well, let's come back to the query in a second. Let me explain uh, how we actually maintain this sort of table. So again, it's the third, I would say, third slide in a row, or third you know, set of slides in a row where we're making use of the pub sublayer. Um, again, we have a stream of updates, and so what we do is we take that stream and we just update a peanuts table. So it's actually very close to what the uh, customer can do with notifications, um, as on the previous slide. Actually, we debated when we were architecting this between just pretending we were an external customer and just sort of doing it once for all the customers that want it, or not using the notifications um, and just sort of using the uh, Tribble system itself and not worrying about the exposed notification and API that we've created. And so, yeah, every time there's a write done to the items table, we just have some writes to do to this index table. So to give you an ex some examples, if you were to add an item to the item table, um, we would add an item to the index. If you were to delete an item, you would delete an item from the index. If you were to update the item type, these uh, records, like you decided something was not a bike but instead a car, we would actually do an insert and a delete on the index because we'd be deleting the uh, bike entry and inserting the car entry. Um, just one second, let me finish up with the slide. So anyway, as you can see what's coming, once you have this index, you make the bike query a lot faster. You can just do a uh, prefix scan. This is one of the ways we, 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 we let customers do range scans. Just do a prefix scan on bike wildcard and you'll get them. Okay, there, I think there are a couple questions. Uh, okay, good, good, good question. No, we actually uh, make sure that the stream of updates has enough information that we can self, that we can update the index with that alone. We don't, so we, in database terms, we make it self-maintainable. We can just look at the update, and that update will contain the old value and the new value, and with that alone, we can do the maintenance on the, the index. So does that mean the client? Uh, what do you mean by the client? 
Uh, well, in this case, there's a client, but it's a client owned by, it's, well, it's a client that we own, but let's just stick with that term, client. No, there's no read to do. The client gets a delta to the base table, so old value and new value, and it contains enough information that it can figure exactly, can determine exactly what record it needs to delete and exactly what record it needs to insert, and there's no need to read either table. Um, they can just be blind on both. They can be blind, blind delete, blind insert. Okay, but who supplies the old value? Um, peanut storage unit. When, it, uh, when it's being updated, it will propagate this value into the pub sub layer, and that's what we're picking up. So the storage unit itself will stick this, this, this information onto the uh, pub sub topic. Yeah. It sounds to me like the pub sub layer could a lot of volume. What could you use in here? So we've uh, built two sorts of pub sub layers. One we're running in production is actually filer based. So there's a lot of disks on each end um, for taking writes at high volume and also for propagating them to the other regions where they're you know, written and then read. And that, that scales. And then we've also built another system. Uh, which we've experimented with but haven't put in production called Hedwig. It's actually an open source hub subsystem, and this one's built on commodity servers. It actually uses a bookkeeper under the covers um, where each topic maps to a bookkeeper, uh, what's called there a bookie. And so, yeah, these are just um, disks that are, th th these are just systems that are meant for taking a large amount of sequential writes and then doing the sequential reads afterwards. But yeah, we capped on this system for quite a bit, actually. Yeah. I have a question. Um, how do you handle prefix scans across multiple tablets that are stored on multiple storage units? Sure, sure. Um, actually, so I'll, I'll generalize the question a little more. Uh, how do we handle scans that are going to cover a lot of uh, records, whether they cross tablets or not? We actually impose a limit on how many records we're willing to return with any one scan. And what we do is we return a continuation object, which the client can treat as a black box and just pass back into their subsequent request. And so we'll use that anytime we reach the record limit or if we reach a tablet boundary because we don't want to deal with the complexity of passing it over, so we just pass back a continuation. Okay. All right, and then uh, another feature I want to talk about is bulk operations. Um, this one's uh, near to my heart, one of the ones I've, you know, spent, I've been working on since I joined about four years ago. Um, we have a lot of users using peanuts just for serving, but we're also seeing more and more that are in some way wanting to combine batch operations and serving. So let me give you an example of, of what I mean. So a lot of our applications want to, uh, a lot of our applications take their click logs, so what's happening at the front end, and dump that into Hadoop using some other processes. And the reason they want that stuff into Hadoop is to understand their users better. So for example, they might run a MapReduce job that looks at the click logs to build um, models of user behavior. Um, but what are the way they want to do with those models is use them at serving time to help decide what to show users. So it doesn't suffice to leave them in HDFS, uh, which is not, not a serving system. So they actually need to ship those uh, profiles or models, whatever you want to call them, um, to peanuts. And the idea is that at, at when clients actually show up to the uh, applications, the applications have a set of candidate content they can show the user, think news articles, uh, for example, and they'll use those models to help decide which of the candidate content to actually present. So we have a pipeline where we're going from HDFS to peanuts in this case. So we have these bulk loads where we're, we're in HDFS and, and need to um, load it. So this is actually something I, I personally did uh, peanuts to do. How, how do you bridge these two systems? And so these, these diagrams that I'll show first won't look that, will look pretty familiar to anyone who's ever taken a, a storage layer and put it under Hadoop, you know, replaced HDFS with something else. So the fir first picture shows how you read from peanuts into Hadoop. And uh, what you see here is that each map task, which wants to read from peanuts, has some record reader. That's a Hadoop concept. And each record reader is responsible for reading a portion of the peanuts table. So what we do in this case is use the tablet map to figure out what portion of the table to give to each map task, to give to each record reader. Then the record reader just uses our uh, range scan API to actually get the records. And then they just feed them up to the map task. The map task is oblivious to where the records came from. Uh, and writing to peanuts is actually even more straightforward. Uh, we have a REST API, as I mentioned. And so when we're running a map or reduce task and want to write to peanuts, 
we actually can just, uh, and we can hide it in an output format, but we actually just make rest calls. Um, the problem with this approach, especially on the right, is that Peanuts is a system that's designed for low latency access, and so, you know, low latency access and subsequent random reads, and so this is actually way, way slower um, than writing to HDFS. And so we've also done some more experimental work trying to uh, bridge this gap. So I don't think I'll, I'll go into great detail with this picture, but I want to give you a feel for the types of things we're trying to do to speed that up. Um, because with these bulk jobs, we don't care about low latency on any particular operation. We care about overall throughput. And so we want to see if we can um, gain back some throughput by sacrificing the latency that we don't even, even need in this case. So in this, this approach, what we do is we, again, use the tablet map to to tell some, the tablet map, um, inform the tasks about it. But in this case, what the tasks do is they actually create a set of what we call snapshot files. There's one snapshot file on each task um, per Peanuts tablet. And when the tasks start writing records, instead of sending them directly to Peanuts, they actually write them to one of these snapshot files. Uh, then we actually have a set of what we call daemons running. And there's daemons running on the Hadoop nodes, and there's daemons running on the Peanuts storage units. And the job of these daemons are to detect snapshot files on the Hadoop side that are complete. Usually that means they've reached a certain size and so they're ready to be shipped over. And um, these sender daemons take these completed snapshots and send them to the uh, corresponding storage unit, having the tablet that uh, the snapshot matches. And then there, there are receiver daemons on the other end that receive these snapshots and, and load them into peanuts. So right now we use uh, MySQL's uh, bulk load utility load load into um, to skip over most of the peanut stack and just load a large file of records into the system. So what I'm not going into here, but I can talk about offline, is we've actually also investigated a bunch of algorithms for uh, when do you sort this data, how big do you make the snapshots, and these things do affect the load time, but I won't, I won't get into any detail now about that. Um, the final feature I wanted to mention is selective replication. This is also something we've done recently. and. Uh, you know, so as Peanuts takes off, we are putting it in more and more data centers. And like I said, a number of our applications are very global in nature, and they want a presence in lots of data centers. So you might have your table in over 10 data centers, and that's way beyond what you need for um, durability. It's only there because you want your table to be available. Uh, but then there's sort of a mismatch between wanting your table to be globally available and needing all of your records to be globally available. Right, so most of your records, you only ever want to read from one or maybe a couple of data centers, especially when we're talking about like user profile records. We also might have legal reasons uh, why we can't put certain records in certain regions. And so to, uh, to cover both of those cases, we, we started, uh, we were adding a selective replication. And so what are we saving here? Um, we, save, we save disk space because now we don't replicate records where they're not needed. And more importantly, we save uh, network bandwidth by not shipping updates to regions that uh, don't need. So we have two modes of uh, selective replication. And uh, one of these modes is static, the other is dynamic. So static is a mode that we're actually putting into production right now. Dynamic is something we've uh, prototyped but aren't putting into production just yet. So static is pretty straightforward. You can define on a per record basis constraints. I want this record to be in Asia and I don't want it to be in Europe, and we'll respect those constraints um, and otherwise try to find at least three locations so we can have durability. Um, dynamics, a little, a little more interesting, but also a little more complex. We want the system itself to decide uh, where to put the records. So we, the intuition here is that anywhere a record is read from is a place where we want to keep a replica, but if a record is not read from a particular region, we should not put a replica there, or if one is there, we should eventually evict it. And we do this using leases. Uh, anytime a record gets read from a particular region, we establish a lease there, which means that record is gonna stay there for some amount of time, no matter what happens. But after the lease has expired, and every time the record is read, the lease will be extended. If a lease ever expires, we are uh, welcome to delete the record, although we actually do it in a lazy fashion. Rather than go seek out records with expired records, uh, expired leases, we actually just wait until the next write happens. And when we go to ship an update, we notice that the record's lease has expired, only then we actually evict it. And while we're doing all this, we still also respect any static constraints that have been provided. Um, you know, record can't be here and so on. 
Okay, I just have a couple slides left. I just want to talk a little bit about the adoption we've had at Yahoo. So we've been in production for about three years, and I would say in the last year and a half, we've really exploded. Um, we have over 100 different Yahoo applications and platforms running on Peanuts, so I just threw out some examples you might be familiar with, movies, travel, and answer answers. Um, to give you an idea of our size, we have over uh, 450 tables and uh, over 50,000 tablets. And in the past 18 months, we've gone from tens of storage units when we were just getting started to thousands of storage units. And uh, we've gone from under five data centers to, to more than 15 now. Um, here's a little bit about the customer experience. This is sort of how we make customers interact with us. Uh, so I said it's a hosted service earlier. I think this is a great thing. Customers don't have to install the system. You know, it's, that's, it's having installed it myself many times, it's not a simple thing. And uh, the other big thing is that customers don't have to wait on a hardware request in general. If you're creating some small application, or at least an application that starts small, uh, generally we have idle capacity and we can just give you your tables in a matter of a day or two. If you have some huge requests, then you might still have to request, wait for hardware. Um, we interact with customers in a couple different ways. Uh, we have architects and also a mailing list to help people get started. Like, you know, I want to, I think I want to use Peanuts. Can you tell me how I might build this application? And so we provide a lot of advice that way. When it comes time for customers to actually get their tables, uh, we do make them file tickets, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then once they're on board, it's, you know, it's pretty minimal, and that's the way we like it. We have a REST API, so they write their clients and they just use uh, REST. And we provide SLAs around availability and latency. And if we're matching those, you know, then they have sort of have nothing to complain about, or at least nothing they didn't know about in advance. And if something's wrong, then then you know we have to uh, we have to provide support. Um, let me come back to the ticketing issue. We could easily make peanuts self-provisioned, and we've just chosen not to. Uh, the ticketing step gives us a good chance to find out what customers are going to be using peanuts for. Um, what's their intended use? We want to get a check on that. Um, if, if they do need to create an order table, we, they'll suggest some initial tablet boundaries. We'll take a look and see if they make sense. And we also want to know what their expected load is so we can provision and build them appropriately. And also if their expected load is something that we can't handle with our current hardware, then we obviously need to know that because we don't want to affect the customers that are already running. So that said, I don't want to give the impression that we make it very um, painful to get started on peanuts. Um, so we also have a sandbox environment, uh, and uh, what this is, is actually a self-provisioned uh, version of Peanuts. And, uh, but of course it's not a production version. You get some test tables that you're sharing hardware with a lot of other people. There's no SLA, and also your data is not replicated, so, it, so it's not a place to work production data. It's really a chance to start building your application and try out the REST API and so on. Uh, so it's a nice environment. I think people actually do try to go into production with it. I mean, looking at the mailing list, it's kind of clear that happens sometimes. And so this is a way where you could get peanuts table and the tables in a matter of five minutes and start playing around with them. Uh, okay, I think that's about it. I just wanted to provide, if you're interested in any of these topics, we published a ton of papers on them. That's part of our job in the research lab. Um, so I've made a list here, but you can contact me later. I also wanted to make mention our YCSB work, if anyone has played around with that, the Yahoo Cloud Serving Benchmark. We compared a bunch of systems, uh, peanuts, and also HBase and Cassandra. That's an open source tool, so you can either see our results in the paper, or if you want to try out the tool itself, there's there's a link to it. So that's that's about it. So I, I guess we're getting pretty late, but any, any other questions? Is this an open source thing that somebody can try out? Or? Parts of it are open source. I didn't mention that the router runs on the traffic server, which is an open source component. And I did mention we have this alternative uh, sub system called Hedwig that's open source. But unfortunately, when we built this system from the beginning, we were not thinking open source, and there's just many dependencies to unwind. And so it's just the type of thing that people want to do, but it's not high enough on the list to get done. So unfortunately, not, not open source at this time. Your yeah. index is going to get hot as well because you require them to be ordered, right? You can get them to use. That's right. Do you do the, uh, the boundary kind of thing you're talking about? The tablet boundary? Yes. When, when, when building building that table, you have to do the same exact thing. At least we're sort of, yeah, so I mean when a customer gives us initial records, we look, if, we're, if they also want an index, we'll have to do the exact same sampling thing on the field that they want to index. We have to go through the exact same step. If they had already created the table and you want to create an index over that, 
that's a complex problem in and of itself, but at least we already have the samples and we don't have to ask for them because the records already exist. But yeah, same, same exact problem. So the index tables are exactly the same as regular tables from a uh, you know, finance perspective, but yes, these, these issues come up. Okay, thanks.